Welcome to the Middlesex Moments radio show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasasha, president of Middlesex Community College, and joining me today is Jim Westheider. Uh, Jim is a professor of American history and chair of social sciences and humanities, so you span, uh, but that really makes sense to me because you're an historian, and I would say my husband, who's an historian, is on the humanities side of history, Uh, so it's one of those fields that clearly crosses those borders. And Jim is from the University of Cincinnati at Claremont College, and he's uh, on campus today uh, and in and around the Middletown area giving lectures uh, that are being scheduled to honor Veterans Day but also to talk about his book, The African American Experience in Vietnam, Brothers in Arms. He's also published about Vietnam in other venues. You have a couple of books to your credit. Uh, Three. Three. Mm -hmm. And I am very curious about lots of things related to this because that was my war too. I'm the Vietnam War generation person. So I'm going to just throw out the first question, but you may go anywhere you wish in this conversation. So my question is... It's dangerous. (laughs) It can be very dangerous. First of all, welcome to, to Connecticut and to Middletown. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's, it's one thing to have, like, experienced the Vietnam War, and, and boy, we all did, mm-hmm. but it's another thing to be a scholar of it and to be a scholar of the individuals mm-hmm. whose lives it changed. So how did, that, how did you get on the road that led you to that? Strangely enough, because of my mentor in African-American history and my grandfather, I became interested in military history, I think, when I was about four years old. Uh, my grandfather was a World War I veteran, and I remember very distinctly uh, sitting there watching TV with him, and he was watching, I think, the CBS World War I series narrated by Robert Ryan. And he's pointing at it going, I was there, I did that. And I'm four years old going, You're, you know, it's amazing. You know, it's black and white and it looked ancient. And I've always had an interest, I think, in military history because of that. When I started college, I wasn't sure exactly what path I wanted to go on. I almost did medical history. I did a lot of work on the Spanish influenza in 1918. And uh, I started working with Dr. Herbert Shapiro the African-American specialist at the University of Cincinnati. And Dr. Shapiro is the one that fired up my interest in African-American history. And he's also the one that uh, taught me to think big. Uh, When we were looking for a dissertation topic for me, and that I was thinking about doing something like that, and I thought, that's, you know, probably too big. It's probably been done already. And he said, no, it's a perfect topic. It's, It's time to do that topic. So I started doing interviews. I've been trained in social history by Dr. Saul Benison, who was part of the original Columbia Oral History Project. So I've had an interest in oral history as well. And I decided to do the study from the ground up, talk to the guys that were actually there, and then build up an image of what it was like to be black and in Vietnam that way. I'm sorry that I have to interrupt this so we can take a break, because, but I want to pick it up exactly at that point, and I'm also very curious about that influenza epidemic of 1918-19. Mm-hmm. And so we'll be right back. At, welcome back. This is the Middlesex Moments radio show, taped right here at Middlesex Community College in Middletown. And today I'm talking with Jim Westheider about the African-American experience in Vietnam and any other topics that come about as a result of our conversation. But let's go back to that oral history, social history mm-hmm. piece. So you started doing interviews. So where, first of all, where did you find the people you were interviewing? Largely through word of mouth, veterans organizations. Well, largely veterans organizations. Mm-hmm. American and, Legion, uh, VFW, and as uh, you, Vietnam veterans. As you start, I mean, mm-hmm. this was such a complicated war. I mean, I mean a piece mm-hmm. of it was that so many people felt disrespected because there was the strength of the anti-war movement. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's now, even today, so many homeless Vietnam War veterans who um, who never really did get back into society. That's um, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so what, as you started talking to them, what were the first things that you started thinking about in terms of what you would want to focus on in your research? Well, I basically let them tell the story. I knew there were problems with military justice. For example, a lot of African Americans felt the military justice system was racist. So that was a good place to start. Uh, another was, was how they got the military in the first place. If they volunteered, if they were drafted. Most of the ones I interviewed actually had actually volunteered. And they did so largely for economic reasons because they didn't have any opportunity in the civilian sector. But it was an interesting cross-section. One of the fun things about it is they initially tried to test me, hmm. you know, because they're veterans. They were there. They wanted to, and they would throw out jargon or things from Vietnam. Oh, right. Yeah. And I knew it. And they started looking at me like, okay, he knows what he's doing. And it was great because they opened up to me. I'll never forget one of them looked at me during the first interview and goes, you know, I don't like white people. I said, that's fine. I'll write that down. Okay, great. You know, And we were, we were fine after that. He really opened up. 
they were glad that somebody was interested in their story, that somebody was trying to chronicle it and get a, get a handle on what they had gone through in the Vietnam War. So I got some great interviews. I also made some great friends. I've got a couple of friends now that very close friends that started out as interviews. Mm-hmm. And, that. and with so I, as you, I'm still trying to kind of figure out, because it's such a complex war, it just is a baseline of understanding it. And, and these are African Americans, and right. some, some mm-hmm. were drafted, some volunteered because, you know, mm-hmm. this was back in the day, right, in the 1960s. So how, how did you begin to, like, draw in your own mind some patterns, and then tell me what your patterns were? Because you must have been looking for patterns. Yeah, like I said, I was looking for incidents of institutional racism in the military and patterns of personal racism as well. There was some information out there already uh, done by, in particular, sociologist Charles Moskos, but no historian had ever looked at it. So we had some idea of what the problems facing African Americans in the military were. So we just basically started at the beginning of the experience, induction, and worked our way through training, assignment, testing, things like that. They did a tour in Vietnam, or in one case with Alan Thomas Jr., he did three tours. Uh, He was a great interview. He was over there in 64, 68, and 72. So yeah, you talk about somebody that was there at the beginning, middle, and end, so he was a perfect interview. So a lot of it just, fell into place chronologically. And also given the fact everybody had different experiences, I sort of let them bring out their own experiences. Many of them were combat veterans, some of them uh, weren't, they were in service units or things like that. So it really depends on what they did. Racism played a lot of different roles in that war, including the fact that Asians were considered different. Oh right, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe there was a little bit more permission to be the scourge that the U.S. Army was in that war in terms of destroying the the countryside and using Agent Orange and you know. So institutional racism. Like how do you how do you like define that in the military? What would it What would you ex- say about that? Patterns or methods of doing things in the military that on the surface are not discriminatory, but in practice end up being so. The Armed Forces Qualification Test is a good example that they gave everybody uh, entering the military. That puts you into five different categories, uh, the testing did. And if you tested into category four or five, you pretty much got to choose your military occupational specialty, anything you wanted. If you tested into category three, they pretty much handed you a rifle and sent you to infantry, infantry training. Now on the surface, anybody it was sheer luck taking the test where you went. But the way the test was constructed, it worked against African Americans. There was a racial bias built into it. When the military changed the test in 1972, made it racially neutral, the grades of African Americans taking the test went up and the grades for the whites stayed neutral, indicating there had been a racial bias in the original test. So that was one area where the military was not trying to be discriminatory, but its very testing practices worked against African Americans. Do you think that the people that you interviewed came to a higher consciousness around race issues as a result of being in that in the Army and in that war? Uh, many of them did, yeah. Some of them did their tour and went home and didn't seem to have any impact, but a lot of them had a profound impact on them. Some of them actually gravitated more towards activism after, the, after being in Vietnam. One of the gentlemen I interviewed uh, had become a heroin addict, ended up in Long Bin Stockade, and... Uh, it was the Nation of Islam, he claimed, that got him off of heroin, not the military. And when he came out, he became an activist for the Nation of Islam. For our listeners, you know, because this is, I don't know, is this 40 years ago now, something like that? What kind of world did the African Americans who were in Vietnam in the service come back into? Because I think that kind of leads to engagement in civil rights action, activism in general, and certainly the Nation of Islam movement. So. Can you talk a little bit about what the U.S. was going through at the same time? Or Yeah, this was a, one of the most turbulent periods, obviously, in American history. The 60s were probably one of the most violent decades in American history. And you've got, on one hand, the promises of the Civil Rights Movement, the uh, Civil Rights Act in 64, Voting Rights Act. And that creates a lot of hope and promise in the black community, but it doesn't address some of the uh, problems facing African Americans, particularly in the North. Poor housing, lack of jobs, poor education. So a certain amount of frustration begins to develop. And they always say revolutions come on the heels of rising expectations. And that's sort of what you see in the 60s. Uh, The civil rights movement had ignited a spark, but a lot of younger African Americans were more attracted to the more militant rhetoric of Malcolm X or the Black Panthers or somebody like that. So you begin to see a new militancy rising up, not only in the United States, but also in the military. 
You know, you, you're, you're um, obviously your subject is to think about like institutional racism, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's there's something, and so that's a kind of a cultural appraisal in a way. You know, what's the culture mm-hmm. actually actually doing, not what it's saying it's doing. But what do, what do you make of the a military cultural be, culture? Because these are individuals who have put through basic training, put some of them into full bore combat. Uh, some of them experience such horrendous things that I'm sure there's no language really to en- encapsulate what they what they saw. So was that a, a conflation then of learning a military culture and a, a world that um, is violent that came together at the same time with this uh, growing awareness of the the intransigent intransigent is that the word? That's a good word. Intransigent yeah. kind of racism that the yeah. United States really embodied now now to a certain extent certainly then. Mm-hmm. Well, the biggest problem was the military after 1948 when uh, President Truman desegregated the armed forces. They had developed a reputation as probably being the most desegregated and racially egalitarian institution in America. In the 1950s and early 60s, that was definitely true. And a lot of African Americans were entering the military expecting that, and it wasn't always living up uh, to its promises. It's hard sometimes, and on one, and one hand, it's easy to change military culture because it's command reflexive. You have to do what they tell you or you're out. But on the other hand, certain things are very ingrained in the military. And while they were preaching equal opportunity, there was also a reluctance, especially by many old line uh, military, to actually implement it. So you've got a dichotomy between what the uh, military is preaching and what many in the military are practicing. Could, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about ROTC, mm-hmm. which was the uh, Reserve, Reserve Officer, Officer Training, Training Corps. Mm-hmm. And wondering, for example, during the Vietnam War, how many, what were the African Americans officers, or or in what percentage would they have been officers among the, that rank oh, yeah, the, of military? One of the neat things about Vietnam is the military was totally integrated, and you do see African Americans throughout the command structure. Problem was there's not a lot of them. Throughout the Vietnam War, the Officer Corps, Average only about 2% African American. In uh, contrast to, for example, the entire body of uh, soldiers who had, and armed personnel who were there. So, what, which what is percentage about, were they? Uh, about 11%, 10 11% of the American forces in Vietnam were African American. Okay. Uh, the problem was they were largely concentrated in combat units. So, you have 10% of the uh, personnel over there are black, but a lot of the combat units are 30, 40, 50% African American. And then, then that would have been apparent to anybody who was there at the time, Very obviously. Apparent. Well, we have to take another break. When we come back, uh, let's let's talk some more about racism in general and the role it plays in, in uh, our society and in the world. Report. Well, uh, we're back for our last segment of the program, and uh, time always runs, the sands run through this hourglass way too quickly for my uh, tastes. But So I want to I go back to this question of racism and talk about, I'd like your assessment, you know, if you were to... Uh, walk into a lecture hall, which you're going to do shortly anyway, <laughs> and somebody said to you this, um, well, you know, is racism on, on the way out in our country? I mean, are we, now, are we in a place where we can look forward now that we have, we have an African-American president elected for a second time, second term, uh, you know, and when schools are integrated and things, things are great, right? What would you say to that? Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay. uh, one of the things I've done in my research and also for my classes is find modern examples of it, especially um, some caricatures of the president, for example. Um, Very racist ones that shocked my students, quite frankly. Um, And they just did a study, I forget who it was, uh, the last, it was a longitudinal study for the last four years. And they argue that the country is more racist now than it was four years ago. Uh, I think it has something to do with the polarization we see in politics today. Um, And I think it's generational too, though. Um, I think younger generations are probably less racist, a little more open-minded, you know, because they've grown up in a different world, a uh, more integrated world. But I still think the problem's out there. Uh, the biggest problem is a lot of people are racist and don't know it. Uh, they carry preconceptions and all that that they don't believe uh, carry uh, racist implications, but they do. And that complicates things, obviously. Um, a lot of my African-American friends in that uh, are very sensitive to things like that. and. They, uh, people don't understand what they're saying sometimes to them. So part of it's misunderstanding. I think part of it's generational. I think part of it's generated by our politics today. And it goes to show you, you were talking about the sands of time. Mm-hmm. You know, change is incremental in history usually. It takes a long time for things to really change. 
So I think we've seen tremendous change since the 1960s, but we're not there yet. Are there instances in history around the world where groups of people have actually come together and been uh, tolerant of differences, whatever the heritage differences or language, language differences? I would think language would be a big piece of this. Or is this just the human condition? Well, it, it varies. I mean, you look at some um, empires throughout the ages, uh, the old Persian Empire, the old uh, Alexandrian Empire, uh, a lot of the uh, Islamic kingdoms. They were multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, multi-religions, uh, and everybody lived together in relative peace. Uh, a lot of the current animosity between Jews and Muslims is relatively new. For hundreds of years, they coexisted rather peacefully. If you look at a lot of the Islamic kingdoms, uh, many of the high officials were actually Jewish or Christian, and especially in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, <clears throat> so you write about the human condition. It depends on the humans involved, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we've either slaughtered each other or been able to live in peace. Mm. So we've had both dichotomies. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could live in peace for a while. It would be great. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, what do you think uh, a young person uh, hearing about institutional racism, somebody, let's say somebody under 24, I think of them as very young, um, <laughs> and we talk about institutional racism, we talk about the Vietnam War, your grandfather mm -hmm. talked about World War One and go, oh, it's a bunch of old people, you know, what are you talking about? Black and white. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly, in, in black and white TV, which yeah. uh, Obama used as an image uh, in the campaign. But, you know, how do you, I mean, I think we have to be vigilant to be sure that we at least don't return to the, the, the worst, most extreme uh, forms of racism in, sure. in, in our mm -hmm. country and around the world. So, But how do you work with young people to help them understand that it exists uh, and also to give them a path into it in order to make sure that they themselves don't, don't, ex don't kind of uh, reproduce it, you know? And, you know, what, and you're, you're a college professor. You must be dealing with young people all the time. Yeah. So what do you do? I try and get them to look at each other's perspective uh, to try and understand the world from the other point of view. Uh, in Cincinnati, we have uh, the African American newspaper is the Herald, and I often have my white students subscribe to it. So uh, they're reading the Cincinnati Enquirer, which is the mainstream press, and then they read the Cincinnati Herald and get a totally different uh, view of some of the issues going on in the city, for example. So one of the things I try and do is expose them you know, to literature from the other side, from views from the other side, and I also encourage my students to speak up. Um, I like a rowdy classroom, mm. and you know, once you, get them, once you get them to break through and that, it's amazing how much they end up sharing and how much uh, perspective they learn from each other. Sure, mm -hmm. and do you have, uh, do you have students who ha are veterans who've been in the military? Uh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what do, do they uh, ever kind of reflect on their experience around this question of racism and the more kind of contemporary experience of being in the armed services? Um, not so much. Um, I've had to do some recent research on diversity in the military, and one of the interesting things is they don't have the same racial problems they had uh, decades ago in Vietnam. Uh, they have a new set of problems. Uh, one problem is um, a growing um, white supremacy movement in the military, uh, neo-Nazi movement, Aryan nation, people like that. It's small, but that's currently the, the major issue they're dealing with that. Uh, but aside from that, um, most people in the military feel it's pretty racially egalitarian anymore. Uh, they probably have more problems with religion than they have with race right and, now in the military. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What do you mean religion? Um, there's a mix right now in the military between a lot of officers that are secular and a lot that are or um, believe in more that evangelical religion, for example. And there's a clash on military values regarding religion in the military, uh, more so than race right now, I would argue. Does the, um, the gender mix change the uh, equation at all? So there are women in the military as well as men? Yes, and they're dealing with some of the same problems that African Americans had to deal with. And are, the they, and are the women, do you think that they are dealing with the racism among the ranks of women? I they're mean, dealing yeah. with gender discrimination more than anything sure. in the military. Uh, not so much racism. Uh -huh. uh, it's gender discrimination, though. Uh, until women, I think, have a full role in the military, it all would be that way. So, Does the military, um, if they were to, to uh, and you must, I assume, read these things, when the military is trying to be sure that 
I suppose that everybody's operating at 100%. That's mm -hmm. what you, you would want. And, and uh, so if you have breakdowns in your group uh, around race or gender or whatever, mm -hmm. so, so what, what kinds of strategies does the military employ to try to make people be able to get along so that they can stay focused on the task at hand? Um, one of them is fitness reports. And what did tell me? Tell me about that. I want to hear about that. <laughs> well, if you want to get promoted, you have to have a good fitness report. And the military, um, this is one of the ways they help deal with uh, racism. To get officers and non-coms more responsive to the issue, it became part of your fitness report. And w okay, so now I'm thinking fitness. Are you healthy, and can you bench press 100 pounds? No, but you're, th this is fitness for duty. This is fitness for duty for uh, your uh, application for work, for tactics, for getting along with your uh, personnel. Uh, the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. and uh, it's become a major part of their fitness report now. So you have to be able to deal with uh, diverse personalities and diverse genders now in the military to get ahead. Sure, and of course, you know, we, we don't have enough time to get into this, but we have a little bit. So the, during the Vietnam War, people were doing terms, limited terms of about a year? Uh, the Army uh, did a year, the Marines being the Marines had to do 14 months. For, okay, a little bit, a little because they're a little tougher. Uh, but now when people are in the military, mm -hmm. they are, how long are the terms in combat zones? Uh, they're still often a year. Often a year, but mm -hmm. then I keep reading. There's some that are rotated in for shorter periods, yeah. Or also that they rotate back, that they end mm -hmm. up going back. Would, and d during the Vietnam period, did we try to limit, or did we allow people to say, no, I'll go back? You had a, a person you interviewed who went back for three, three times. Three times, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you were in the military long enough, you uh, probably ended up in Vietnam more than once. It really depended on your military occupational specialty. Mm. Um, if you were in certain fields, you never got near Vietnam. If you're a clerical, for example, not many clerical personnel were sent to Vietnam. Um, intelligence uh, personnel, a lot of them ended up in Vietnam, but many of them did not. Uh, so if you're in infantry, armor, branches like that, you probably did at least one tour, maybe two or three. And what do you, um, how do you uh, weave into this whole uh, discussion of uh, racism in the military and in our own society with mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress syndrome? I mean, is, did that exact, did people re even recognize that during the Vietnam War? Oh, and yeah. Did mm -hmm. they, yeah, and, and did it just exacerbate the, the kinds of uh, dysfunctional interactions that people were having or? Uh, uh, many black veterans believe it did, that uh, the impact of racism made it a lot worse. Um, it probably had more to do with those obviously direct, more directly involved in combat, but uh, some of the stresses over there, even if you weren't in combat, would lead to it. So yeah, a lot of them argue that um, just dealing with the white uh, establishment was stressful enough. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to deal a lot of times with some um, <clears throat> white soldiers that were flying Confederate flags over their hooches, which was a major problem. It was like running a red flag to a bull. And there were, there were gang fights over it in Vietnam when whites refused to take down the Confederate flag. And a lot of African Americans were saying, I'm not here fighting for the Confederacy. Right. So right. they'd run up black power flags. And then you'd have um, a discussion on which flag stayed up. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So have you been to Vietnam yourself? Yes, I have. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, did, what was your experience when you went there? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, it's a different country than when we were over there. Um, in the cities, half the population of Vietnam was born since the war. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. yeah, and their image of America is a lot different than the older population. Uh, when I was in the bigger cities like Ho Chi Minh City or Da Nang, uh, they're used to seeing tourists, they're used to seeing Americans, they like us. When I was out in the uh, provinces near the Cambodian border and all that, they're not used to seeing foreigners, so they still were a little uh, reluctant to talk to us mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. But it's a beautiful country. Um, and the thing that interested me was the official government line when you go to a lot of places like Quezon and that, um, you know, it's pretty much anti-American, but you talk to the people and you don't get that feeling. Uh, they like Americans, they're glad we're over there. Um, one of the most moving experiences I had was at uh, May Lai, talking to some Vietnamese there and all that. So um, I see a very happy future for the United States in Vietnam. Um, I think politics are pushing us together, uh, especially with their fears of the uh, People's Republic of China and some of the um, uh, disputes Vietnam has with China over the South China Sea. I think the United States is actually uh, becoming closer an ally to Vietnam because of that. Yeah. 
uh, I was I thought it was very ironic that we're ne- we're negotiating to move back into Cameron Bay. <laughs> so tells you that things go full. So circle. did you see Cameron Bay with your own eyes? Yeah. Yeah, is it, and it's gorgeous. Yes. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's, I mean, it's, it's major port now too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Well. Um, it, you know, I mean, I think obviously America had a military interest in Southeast Asia. That was part of why we were there. Uh, and uh, Taiwan plays into that as well. Um, yes, it does. Yeah, and, there's, uh, and uh, South Korea. Yeah, it's definitely a part of the world to watch. But again, you know, and again, I mean, I, th- I hope people will read your book. They can so get it. They yeah. can get it on Amazon.com. I know because I looked mm-hmm. earlier this afternoon, uh, and I recommend that they do that. Uh, for a lot of reasons, and one of which is, you know, and, and I'm sure as an historian you're going to agree with me, uh, this may be something that happened 40 years ago in the past, but these things are uh, absolutely 100% relevant today. And mm-hmm. so when we think about, for example, the geopolitical balance of power and our U.S. relations with Asia, uh, understanding the history of the Vietnam War period, all of it, including our own history with it, uh, because it may have happened uh, far away, but it happened here at home as well, mm-hmm. that, which was the slogan, bring the war home, uh, are, are really the only paths forward to, I think, I think moving towards some kind of peaceful, interconnected, uh, mutually beneficial relations with people who are mm-hmm. on the other side of the globe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been, been, I, I'm looking forward to hearing your lecture, and it's so great that you were willing to take the time to meet with me today. I have to uh, say at the end of the program that uh, this has been the Middlesex Moments radio show, and today I've been visiting with Jim Westheider, who's written a book called The African American Experience in Vietnam, Brothers in Arms. And there are several other books, too, all of which are available on Amazon.com. Uh, we, Middlesex Community College, are available at our own website at mxcc.edu 24-7. You can check us out anytime you wish. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, wishing you a good day. <laughs>